programming, uh, some of the funding strategies, things like that. But let me take a step back and kind of explain who we are as an organization. We, um, our main office is in New York with a couple of other offices, and we just focus on parks and public spaces. We've been, um, as a firm, working on public spaces for 35 years, and that's that's all we do. Um, uh, it started with a, a park in New York, a park called Bryant Park, um, uh, and has extended to some other parks around the country. And so, all of our parks are parks that have uh, public-private partnerships in place, and um, have a partner like the Conservancy um, that works with a government partner, be it city, state, county, um, to make parks the best possible places they can be. And um, as Michelle explained, the, the Conservancy came from a few different organizations. And obviously, the lease of, of Belle Isle is a fairly new thing. So for a couple years, as many of you guys have known and, and I'm sure experienced, there's been kind of questions in the air. Who does what? Whose job is this? Uh, whose job is that? And what we're going to try our best to do is sort that all out. It, and um, part of the way that we're getting there is by asking a couple different questions. And, and one is sort of, what does the island look like? What, what should be there? And what programs, what amenities, what facilities are really important that we work on? What events should come in and come out? What events should not be in place at all? What uh, programs would attract this specific demographic from this part of the community? Um, we feel that in urban parks, uh, programming, and I'm going to define that term extremely broadly, is very, very key to making public spaces work. And so let me step back and define that very really broadly. When we say programming and amenities, we mean natural areas. Natural areas are part of the program of the park. I'm not saying that everything needs to be hyperactive and busy with things. I'm saying that the idea of enriching our natural areas, as is the case on Bell Isle, I think we would all agree is, is really the primary driver. Uh, that's part of the program. Having areas that are that are contemplative and passive is part of the program for the island. But then also having places where there are activities, where there's um, board games or there's small musical performances, things like that. That also might be part of the program for the island. So a big question that we want to get lots of opinions on, um, and I'll, I'll uh, mind my airtime. I've been talking too long already. Right. But is what kind of program makes sense? What would um, uh, appeal to people and bring people out? We feel that a big part of community engagement is thinking about program. Um, so, can most of you see the image that's on the screen up there right now? It's sort of uh, no. improvised no, a little I didn't bit. Realize it it's, it's projected on the wall. You know, we're having a little trouble getting it there. So, I was going to show a couple of images of parks that we've worked on. Um, maybe I'll, I'll flip through them really, really quickly. Uh, just, to, just to give you a little bit of a sense of who we are, but, but I'll do it in one minute. Do you want to advance that for me, please? Thank you. So this is Bryant Park 4. It was a really dangerous, tough place, not akin to Belle Isle in that sense. It was a tough place. And the programming, the amenities, the attention to detail, working with community, part of what brought it back. We'll keep going. You can just flip through them for a minute. Oh, out today. I mean, sorry, Bright Park today, um, uh, a more active space. These are, these are, you know, the law is most people that come to Bright Park are not engaged in the program. There's lots of programming that's like sort of baseline for having people there, but most people are coming to get out of their office. This is in an office district, different than not. Uh, um, our winter setup, you can't really see. You just keep going through these. But um, parks in areas, Dallas, one of the big challenges that we had to work with the community on was when we sat down in meetings like this in Dallas, they said, um, I'm not sure if you've been here before, but nobody's walked a quarter mile in 25 years. <laughs> um, and we knew that to engage people, to get people, and nobody comes downtown. I mean, it was just a place that nobody came downtown. It's more spread out than, than Detroit is. Um, and we, we knew that we had to get programs from all those spread out places to get people from their communities to see something they trusted from Grapevine or Plano and, and get them downtown. Um, yeah, and then I guess there's other images of park in Newark, New Jersey, which we just opened a couple years ago, which had challenges that were very similar to a lot of the ones that we've seen in Detroit. And uh, uh, 
programming, and amenities, and management, working with the community, and saying we're doing here are really key. So, um, with that, I, I'd love to sort of open the idea to, to talking about programs and amenities, and, and parts of, of Bell Island should be emphasized, and, and what could be added, what could be renewed, what could be enriched, um, and what shouldn't be around. Does anybody want to get us started on that? I have, uh, here, you can go back a little bit here. So, sure. Please. I have a list, but I won't, I won't cover it all so that I give everybody the most of your time. The uh, primary thing is I'm a bike rider, and so I'm real concerned about the bike lanes being maintained and cleaned on a regular basis because they're not right now. Mm -hmm. And then there are two places where the bike lanes actually cross the road, mm -hmm. and they're not painted and marked or signed. Mm -hmm. Again, kind of a dangerous spot. Um, the, the other, you know, uh, for those of us who've been around a while in, in Nobel Isle, is looking to see that you re utilize the boat club in, in a community kind of way, or yeah. at least in a public way, whether it's a restaurant, a mini hotel, or you know, rooms, there's, there's some way that the public can take advantage of it and not necessarily be a private entity. I, I don't know who owns it right now, but um, I love the canoes or the kayaks that are coming in. Uh, I'd like to see more food trucks. They sell one. So people have food options that they haven't had before. Uh, I don't know if the bathhouse has been updated, but um, she mentioned one of the things that I'm real concerned is I've been riding on the island for at least 20 years, is that the black community has left and not come back. I mean, a little, I'm seeing a trickle this year, and, and so I'm real concerned uh, about that outreach component, and maybe it has to be through the churches and the pastors. Um, more tables, more shelters, Maybe the equestrian. I know that's been floated for a number of years, all that idea. I'd love to see something happen with the zoo. You know, it breaks my heart that something, so much money was invested that, in that, and that a lot of urban kids don't have access to yeah. something like that. They, yeah. they'll never get out to Royal Oak. It's right. giving them that kind of access. I'm OK with camping, especially for urban youth, again, because they may never have that opportunity. Uh, getting the Caroline. Up and running, so it's played as opposed to recorded music. That's kind of weird. Um, band shells, getting the band shells activated, and then have the kind of concerts you talked about it. And more work on the gardens. And those of us who appeared years ago we remember how beautiful the gardens were. Yeah. So that would be a great thing. And I'll just, Michelle, are you here? So, yeah. Thank Michelle? You. I'll, leave my yes. list. Right I'll leave my list with your Katie. I'll yeah. leave it with Katie. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, oh, sorry. Um, <clears throat> I think Bell Isle, um, it, has, it had a lot of programming, taking sessions, a giant slide. Um, I'd like to see some of that where people know if they come to the island, they can just do these particular things. They can go to the beach and get lunch or whatever at the concessions. Mm -hmm. They can go on the giant slide. The zoo was fantastic and it was innovative. You know, that, that animals were in, in, in cages, sort of. Yeah, yeah. They were in cages. Well, we were in cages we were that in the animals were, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I remember that. We were in enclosures. Enclosures, yeah. And um, I remember that the horses used to be, um, the police horses used to be on the island. And you got to ride or look at them or whatever. Yeah. But, you know, that was just something that helped with the city. It gave something, a place for the, the horses to be. But then it was sort of entertaining to people who are there on the island. So I really think that there are a lot of things that we could just kind of do a restart. And it would help to, um, you know, attract the island again. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I've, I've seen you a couple times, like, and I'm, your first name is George. George, excuse me. So, George, have you been charged with responsibility by? It's the DNR that's contracting you, yes? No. no. So it's a conservancy. Uh, in partnership with, 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 in partnership with the DNR. Yeah. All right. So, and this is a question I haven't really gotten an answer to. Uh, do you have two plans? Uh, one plan with a racetrack. How, how do we? Excuse me, how do we develop a beautiful, tranquil, fabulous, natural sanctuary with a racetrack? 
So that's that's going to be a, that's going to be that's going to be one plan. And then Plan B would be if it was returned to its jewel-like state prior to the Grand Prix has made such a huge difference in the improvement of Belle Isle. Yeah. I have nothing against racing. I have nothing against Roger Penske and the Grand Prix. And I know that Belle Isle was a decaying embarrassment. And the Grand Prix has been able to really make some fabulous improvements. And I honor that and I respect it. But that doesn't allow a lifetime entitlement to rape and pillage the island. Thank you. Uh, so I wonder if you have a plan B that includes no racetrack. No 450,000 square foot cement paddock that can be seen from outer space, like Yangtze Dam in China. I mean, it's 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 impossible. Can be seen from outer space. Can you, uh, you know? Uh, can you imagine a uh, a Trans Am race in Kensington Park, which is a you, you, you know Kensington Park. I, you know you're from out of town, but, you, but I can't imagine them dropping a racetrack like a Trans Am track in, in the middle. So do you have two plans with the track and without a track? Uh, I don't think we're thinking about it in terms of specifically two plans with, with track, without track. How can you that, do a plan without knowing whether there's, it'd be like planning. Oh, uh, I, mean, like, I think that, um, that would be I like mean, planning a building and not realizing there's an elevator shaft in the middle of the space and you go, oh wow, you know, we can't have this gymnasium here because there's an elevator going yeah. through. Well, how do you plan? No, I mean, I think that we're, we're um, thinking about the Grand Prix as we think about programming on the island. I mean, and, and I, just like I'm not going to um, uh, say there should definitely, right now, there should definitely be horseback riding on the island, I think that the part of what I'm here to do is part of my charge is listen right now. Okay. And so giving, answering about what there should be and what there shouldn't be is, is premature. Uh, yeah, I'm, listen, I'm not asking if there should be a carousel ride on Bill Isle or not. I'm talking about a Grand Prix track. It's like, you know, there must be, uh, uh, sorry, excuse me. Janet, I know I've, ex okay. I've extended yeah, my hair. One, two, two, three, four. Remember your number, five, six. <laughs> <laughs> one. One. I don't know if you can do anything about it, but there's probably more of the, the DNR. The drainage system on Bell Isle. Is anybody trying to uh, address that? Because if you go back into the wilderness areas, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just water off. That's even a lot of the trees have actually have to do roots have actually rot in the trees that fell off. And the solution to that Grand Prix, which was going to be a solution to the community complaining about it, was the old state that fat ground that had been a beautiful racetrack. Here, here. Well, the, neighbors, the neighbors didn't want it. The neighborhood didn't want it. Yeah. They didn't want it. Who was number two? Um, yes, I'm another voice uh, in ac opposition to that racetrack. Uh, I'm a walker on Belle Isle, and that racetrack occupies one third of the year, March through the, June. And uh, the barricades start going up, places are inaccessible, and um, it's, can you imagine a racetrack in Central Park? I mean, that's how incongruous that thing is. The other thing is, there was an uh, agricultural program for Detroit youth the Go Lightly School used the greenhouses. Now I saw this spring that somebody was using those greenhouses, I don't know who, but if that, if that program for Detroit youth could be restored, I think that would be a, a great uh, uh, advance. Yeah. Thank you. I've been on the panel, uh, I guess, once <laughs> in, in, in the recent period, and I went to a program at the Detroit Yacht Club. And I live near Bell Island. I live on Mac and Hill Court. And so I was with my daughter, who was an adult. And we said, since we live so close, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll just walk home. And uh, we took a few feet. And uh, pretty soon, two police cars came up. And they asked, well, we, what were we doing? I said, I'm walking. <laughs> so uh, there's a there's a line, a painted line around. Mm -hmm. He says, "Well, you can't be on this side of the painted line. You have to be up over there." Well, you know, I, I used to run Bell Island. It's run. I've been yeah. running Bell Island for four years. So I said, "There's one. There's no one behind me. There were, my daughter and I were the only two people on that part of the line." Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm like everybody else, sometimes I'm sensitive about races, sometimes I'm not. Right. 
point as the only two black people in sight, uh, and two white officers come up and ask me, what are you doing? You know, I really don't want to say, seriously, you ain't got damn business. Thank you. I mean, that's the, that's the feel I have, but I'm not, I don't I trouble I'm trying to get home. But I mean, <laughs> but I'm just saying, that's the kind of feeling that you, there, there was no reason for that. And I, it, it Is makes, it the state police? Is uh, it the state police? Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, to be honest with you, I see skin color and badge, and I don't, federal, state, my experience has been fairly similar. So, but I'm just concerned about that. Now, maybe the person, they can be trained like on how to approach people. I, I, I thought he approached us inappropriately. Uh, I think it could have been a way to approach it. But I would say this, uh, they talk about tracking certain people back. And I think training police officers or whoever uh, appropriately in terms of how to engage the public is going to be a major part of success out no matter who's on the mm -hmm. Because it, my sense now, in terms of the most recent client, that people are just not, any people are not going to be insulted and abused by police anymore. Yep. I think we have broken that period of American history. And uh, the more young people you get out, no matter who they are, they're going to be less inclined to be bullied by police. I'm just saying, I just think that the <coughs> police, the training, police, and also not just training, one other thing, that if we're going to have uh, police, police need to be representative of who you want. I mean, you can't have a, a police department that so we're open. Uh, we have 55 police officers. We've got 53 white, you know, two black, and uh, uh, but these guys are nice. You're going to have to maintain some balance on some level in order to even get that message across, even if the nice people in the world with you. So that, that, that was just, I just had one experience and I said, I, you know, I'm, not, I'm not going back for a while. I, 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 just, I don't need the aggravation. When did that happen? Uh, it happened like uh, last year. Last year. No, so the program at the, uh, at the yacht club that we were given, I just said, you know, I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not hostile to the I'm a pro that I'm in the field. I'm just, you know, it's not just yeah. nature. So I'm just saying, I think the treatment, I, I think how, how Police authority to engage citizens. It is vital. That's the important. Who was number four? Okay. Uh, mine's a little bit uh, more familiar. I've been on the island, but my grandchildren really enjoy the beach. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, on, it's a wonderful big beach. Right. And a lot of people can't get to other beaches, use that beach, and enjoy the hot summer days. But there are no lifeguards. And I don't know why you have that spread of a beach. It's a huge beach. With no lifeguard uh, there. I think when the city had it, there were like three chairs of lifeguards. And you know, these high school and college students a job. Yeah. And I, 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 for that size beach, I thought it was, and, you know, unconscionable not to have a lifeguard. Number one, right next to the beach is that water slide. Yeah. It's not in use, and there's stagnant water. It just looks horrible. And it's right next to the beach, and uh, I don't know whether you plan on reusing it or, but there's stagnant water sitting at the bottom of the slide, and it just looks terrible. Mm -hmm. And a lot of kids are passing all of this because they're on the beach. And um, there's one building that used to have, I don't even know the name of the building, it's not too far when you come onto the island. It used it was a small building, it used to have a jazz concert. So maybe that's, that was that a ice skating. That was an ice skating. Oh, really? Ice skating. Yeah, I'm not a, a native Detroit, so I don't know how it was used in the past. But it's a great space uh, yeah. for maybe concerts, and that maybe got my own personal uh, interest. And then there's a concert on the island this weekend, the eighth, uh, the first and second. Yeah. And I don't know if it's spread all over the island and where the location is. You have no, you have no idea what part of the island that's going to take place. So this one. Who was number five? The segue uh, into the comment that Reverend Aldridge made for my first request, and that is to utilize the um, open fields or open lots for uh, parking. One of the reasons many African Americans don't come to the park now is because they can't afford insurance and the state police mm -hmm. are writing them tickets. Sometimes um, a family member may have a warrant they don't know about for a traffic offense, and they come to the island and they end up in jail. So rather than avoid the hassle, they just don't come anymore, and that's a shame. But you've got this 
large spans of concrete right in front of the casino that could be turned into public parking and uh, partner that with some bike rentals so that people who may have an issue with their license tag don't have to worry about driving around the island in the car to attract a harassing police officer who might pull them over for some appropriate or inappropriate reason, number one. If not that space in front of the casino, then that open field where Unity Royal used to be, right there at the uh, opening of the park, so that people can park their cars, rent a bike, or park their cars and walk over the bridge. Uh, the other thing is, open the golf course. That was a great par three golf course. I used to love to play it before going to work. It's grow overgrown now. It does need drainage. But it was a great part of the course, and it should be opened. It was a wonderful executive course, and it would also be a wonderful amenity for people who are visiting mm -hmm. the convention downtown. Mm -hmm. If they can go play a nice round while they're visiting, they don't have to go far and do it. It would be just great. And you've got a wonderful practice center there already. Right. Yeah. Who was number five? I, think number I was six. five. I could bring number six. Yeah, number, number, number six. six. I was in six, but I have something to say. Who is number six? I'd like to be seven. You were number six right there. Sandy is seven. You are eight. Nine. Remember your numbers. I used to be able to row on Belle Isle, Belle Isle through Detroit Parks and Rec. Now, with the new structure on Belle Isle, you have to be a member of the boat club as well as pay the fees to row. That is prohibitive. So, a sport that I normally would participate in, I cannot participate in it. I cannot participate in Wyandotte. I cannot participate in any of the other hamlets. But I can ride my bike to Belle Isle. And something needs to be done about that. In previous years, that was a program that was managed by Detroit Parks and Recreation. And there needs to be some kind of provision to make sure that that is accessible. That's my number one. I'm also a biker. I bike Bell Isle every morning at daybreak. Can we get the bathrooms open with consistency? They may say open, but they're locked. And they may remain locked till about 8, 9 o'clock. So access is one in terms of programming because that is the only way young women or anyone can become familiar with, with our waterways. Okay. Are you seven? Yes. I was eight. You were eight, okay. Sandy? Thanks. <laughs> well, I'm a female librarian. I've done a little research, and I, I actually found some um, interviews of Dan Biederman from um, your company. And I want to read two of them, actually. One of them is, um, he says, um, I start with a vision and then raise money from private sources. I don't seek public funds because there are strings attached to how the money can be spent. Also, I work mostly in commercial districts. I'd rather not compete for funds in neighborhoods that have few options for improvement other than government. Well, well I mean, I, I'm happy to address sort of how I think that statement, what well, he means by that. I, I'm just going to kind of leave it, and then I'm going to go on to Great. the next thing. Fine. Okay. Because I want to use the two words, strings attached. OK. Then I found a really, love this quote from the Los Angeles Times. Um, where Mr. Biederman was interviewed, and he was asked about Fashion Week, right. which apparently was a program that used to be on, in Bryant Park, which is no longer there. Right. Is that correct? Keep okay, well, I want to read this, because this sounds great. He, um, it says, um, well, first of all, the Bryant Park Corporation insists that all events are free and open to the public, the exceptions being the New York Fashion Week, that used to take over the park in winter and late summer. Biederman often publicly expressed his frustration that the fashion shows, which were not under the BPC's control, took over the park for two weeks twice until February. 
and here's a quote from Dan Buterman. They pay us a million dollars. It's a million dollars I would happily do without, he told the Los Angeles Times. BPC was particularly frustrated that the fashion shows dominated the park during two crucial times, in late summer when the weather is perfect for park visitors and in early February necessitating the early closure of the park's popular free admission ice skating rink. And that's kind of how I think many people are feeling about the, the car races, not just the Grand Prix, but the Red Bull. And I will back up and say that I have been a supporter of car racing, used to go to car racing a lot. I'm just not at the level of what's happened on Belle Isle, and I think Mr. Biederman's um, example here is a really good one, um, showing what's, how he felt, people felt in New York, and you know how many people Detroiters feel about um, Belle Isle and the Grand Prix. Thanks. Uh, I just, one of my goals, I think, for really for Belle Isle, and, and it is, I think, a goal that you share, is to have a plan, an overall overarching plan, and, and incorporating all these different ideas to a lesser or greater extent. But I think it's a plan that isn't designed around a car, but rather is as a park and a park that bikers use, walkers use, picnickers use, people use. And I think your example of being on the wrong side of the line, to me, speaks to some of the bullying that's been going on, but also the idea that if this, park, this park is still about the almighty car driving around this island, and you as the pedestrian have been relegated to this tiny little area we got to walk on the side along with the bikers on safely crossing four lanes of traffic, which to me, I, I think is is criminal. Actually, if someone was to get hit, I, I honestly think you could sue because you have somebody just crossing across four lanes of traffic with no yield, no stop, no anything. And that to me is because there was no plan for anyone except for the car, and the car, including the car races, has been what this. Island has sort of evolved as far as development. The programming that has been there, unfortunately, I think has has, has disappeared through privatization and lack of uh, lack of funding. But I, I think privatization, I, you know, I, I saw the closing of the zoo and the closing of the aquarium, which thankfully is reopened, as as sort of a other interest, just not interested in putting the money in there. And so I think you know we can, as a community, decide where we want to put that money or what kind of programs need to be there. But I think the overall plan really needs to be about access and not just access by car. I think parking is an important thing because parking right now is higgledy-piggledy and sort of interferes with pedestrians and bikers because people park in the middle of a bike lane. But I also think there is no public transport onto the island for people who don't have cars. And I have thought that public transport is a, kind of a no-brainer that really should exist. There should be public transport and someone shouldn't have to worry about driving a car on the island. They should be able to just get onto the island. Mom, you missed me. Seven. Oh, seven. Oh, seven. Oh, seven. Oh, seven. She's much pretty than I am, so I, I didn't have the heart. All right, go ahead, Paul. You know I can be what? Uh, this woman is the second mother to me, so that says a lot. Um, please pass this around. My name is Paul Lee. Uh, I'm an historian specializing on uh, global black history and culture. And I noticed there's a subtext in what's been said today, and that's what the issue that people don't like to talk about, race, which is rather ironic considering it's a majority African American city. But when the research was done in terms of what's being done on Belle Isle, I wonder was that looked into? Because Belle Isle has a specific racial meaning within the history of Detroit. Mm -hmm. uh, the 1943 riot, as white people call it, was known in the black community as the Battle of Belle Isle. Sure. Because there was a rumor that a white man had thrown a black woman off the Belle Isle Bridge into the Detroit River. White people had a similar r rumor about a white person being attacked. And while it's called a riot, it would most probably it would better be called a pogrom, because whites from all over Detroit attacked black people wherever they were, not just pulling them out of taxis and cars and trolleys on Woodward Avenue, but invading their communities, including Back Bottom and Paradise Valley. 
It has another specific racial meaning that uh, I, I'm passing around there. This is Mrs. Teresa Kelly, who is the publisher of the Michigan Citizen. The state's most influential African-American paper, which unfortunately stopped publication just around Christmas. But in 2007, they invited me to do a, a memorial, they invited me to do a series memorializing the 1967 rebellion. Anyone who calls it riot either wasn't here or was ignorant of the social conditions that produced that explosion. But in the series, we printed this photo, which was shot on Belle Isle. Now, it looks like a concentration camp. And let me read you the cut line. Balcatraz. After the local jails and out Detroit prisons were filled to capacity, the Detroit Police Department and the DSR hastily converted the women's bathhouse on Belle Isle on the Detroit River into a makeshift detention center complete with guard towers and floodlights, which the inmates dubbed Balcatraz after Alcatraz, the infamous federal prison in the San Francisco Bay. Now, because of D Detroit has always been a segregated city, and it's now resegregating with gentrification. When I was young, you would, if you look like me, you could risk your life crossing Eight Mile. If you went too far uh, east and crossed Alter Road into the Gross Points, you were in danger. If you went too far west and crossed into Dearborn, you were in danger. The mayor at that time, Orville Hubbard, had a famous motto called Keep Dearborn Clean, which we understood Keep Dearborn White. And there weren't many spaces for us to recreate. There were parks in Dearborn on the east side and parks in uh, I mean, Dearborn on the west side and Parks and Dearborn on the east side, which we couldn't get into or were not made welcome. Mm -hmm. If you crossed Eight Mile, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Belle Isle, in that sense, became a free zone for African Americans. And the kind of amenities that I hear being talked about, the canoes and the giant slide and the zoo and the aquarium, most African Americans that I know never made any use of that. I grew up on Belle Isle. I never made any use of that. What it was for us is it was a release valve for the pressures of living in this city because the white power structure and most white Detroiters during most of my lifetime made it clear we want your labor but we don't want you as a neighbor. And Dr. Carl Gregory, the economist, says that the rebellion in 67 probably would have happened a few years earlier were it not for Belle Isle because that was a release valve. And while you talk about all these amenities, you talk to most African Americans, including those in the room, ask them what you did on Belle Isle. We partied on Belle Isle. There was a lover's lane on Belle Isle. We had family reunions. The Shrine of the Black Madonna Church had, had services there. It, it, it served a specific, it, it occupied a specific cultural space where African Americans felt free from harassment, from judgment to be themselves. And when the state, with the state takeover, I wonder if anyone asked the question, what does the majority population feel about this space? And how should it be used? And you've had Reverend Aldrich and this sister and others talk about the unwelcoming atmosphere so what was a free space and a release valve for us now feels like it is a closed space. I want to just make one more suggestion in terms of something that's recent. Dr. Kafense Chike, who's an historian of African American history at Wayne State University, created something, an annual festival every year called the Adasi Festival. And what it's designed to do is create a sense of communion among African Americans with their ancestral homeland. And they have a ritual at 6 o'clock in the morning on Belle Isle using the medium of the water to give a sense of spiritual connectedness with their ancestry. That's what Belle Isle is to African Americans. And I've heard nothing that's been said and nothing that I've seen on YouTube and nothing I've read in the papers shows the slightest comprehension of what Belle Isle means to the majority population in the city. And I'd like to know in terms of whatever the plans are being made, did anyone bother to ask, what do most of y'all want? And I would say that, and I thank you for your comments and, and all that, and I would say that that's what we're doing right now. Is is uh, you know asking? Um, that's what we're doing right now. Um, well, well, I I I would like to speak. Oh, yeah. That was so Go ahead, beautiful. And beautiful. It's amazing. Thank you. This is what Colorado yeah. is. It's where we have to build the social capital. We have to get the trust back. We have to work together. And um, that's what makes me love what I get to do, because it felt like to be that place of healing. In fact, I'd love some feedback. We, um, I read an article recently about um, a, a, a white minister actually wrote it. Many of you probably read it. But he, he, he beautifully stated the history of Bella and it was primarily from a black perspective. And he pointed out two things that I thought might be a really um, great opportunity for healing. 
And one was um, the DNR when it was taking, and Ray, I haven't even had a chance to talk to you about this, Amanda, but apparently when the DNR was taking down the diseased trees, it had some criteria that it was looking at and um, unknowingly took down some trees that the African American community used as a healing garden. And thought, oh no, unintended consequences oh. because we're not embedded in the community, oh. because we don't know our customer, we're not working closely together, we do oh. dumb things like that, right? And then the second thing was, so sad, save our sons and daughters. Um, they too had a garden over by where the, um, the concrete is now for the Penske parking lot. And um, those came down unknowingly. I thought, that's just, those are two travesties that we have to fix. And you're so right about the rebellion. It's not a riot, and justice breeds that kind of thing. And that's exactly what caused all of that. So we have to get back to being a whole community together. Thank so you. I'm going to come give you a hug. <laughs> you guys can excuse me for belly aching. <laughs>
Yes, you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Monique. Good afternoon. Um, so I recently, uh, I worked at Osborne High School for two years as a math student, and I'm interested in finding out how we can make um, Bell out a little bit more friendly to our school so that they can come and do their programming there um, for school-age children. I don't know if that means, I don't know how um, many students go to um, Bell out for like conditioning or athletic activities or just have like their big competitions or um, tournaments. And I think that would probably be, that would probably be a really great um, space for uh, community athletics. Um, although it's a little off the way from the West Siders, it's fun. Um, and, yeah. um, and I don't know, uh, you mentioned this when you came in, I don't know if there's still like transportation, like if, to the island, or that is something that you are interested in, kind of? You know, most of these things have brought transportation to the islands. The Detroit uh, Transit used to run a bus out of the shed right there. Now, here is something that's going to get me in trouble. I hear all the things about police harassment, African Americans that yeah. have, have we thought about interacting with? I was out there with the, the DNR, and it was on a holiday. I stopped off at the Tim Hortons. About coffee, donuts, cream, when I text the guys, hey. Oh man, thanks a lot, thanks a lot. Yeah, right. You, right, how you doing? You know, where are you from? Oh, well, we actually come down from the front. I say, did, 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 did y'all volunteer for that? No, man, we, we were told we got to spend so many days down there. Yeah, so and so, so and so. And, I start, and I, he started talking so much, I go, okay, okay, I just wanted to bring you coffee. Why don't we start again? You know, I hear all this and they go, why don't we start interacting with police? I'm close to 70 years old. Four months short of seven. I have never had problems with it. I've been in Ghost Point right now. Stopped by the Ghost Point police. He pulled me over. I rolled down, did, pulled over to the side, put my car in park, turned off, turned emergency flashes, interior lights, traveled back. He said, good evening, sir, good evening. He said, you know why I stopped you? I said, did I take a complete stop with that light? He said, no, you didn't. So he had any tickets? I said, I mean, I had a ticket since 1996. I was in that accident. He said, can I see drive back from your stretcher? Sure. Craig, Mr. Jones, uh, you need to watch it next time. Have a good day. Thank you. Time to come on home. Why don't we start interacting with the police instead of being hostile? <coughs> you know, that's the, I think that's the main problem. Don't get hostile. He has his job to do. There are racist cops out here, but don't stir the pot. Keep, you know. And and I have not had problems with with, with DNR or the state police. You want the few too, but <laughs> well, maybe if somebody would do what I do. I would be in the minority, uh, you know, in the majority and not in the minority. I mean, if he stops me, stop me. If you ain't did nothing about well, my your parents told me the small child. <coughs> if you haven't done nothing, don't know what told us. Call that to uh, Michael Brown. That's right. Uh, okay. Uh, um, I'm a native, native Detroiter, oh, and I, my family grew up using the amenities. I mean, like every amenity we possibly could on Bell Isle. The equestrian, you used to love going horseback riding. You, you could ice skate on the pond, the, the giant slide, just everything that you could possibly do on Bell Isle. I have never stopped going to Bell Isle. I never have. Uh, last year when the changeover happened, I would go just to assess what's going on because I wanted to know. And so I saw that there was a big shift in um, population. And I was watching the information coming across social media and the outcry that was going on. And that's a big concern. Like many people have mentioned, making it more friendly and inviting and attractive to the African American population that lives in the city of residence. And so my question, and I loved your impassioned outcry wanting to connect with you know, the spirituality of what it means to Bell Isle to the African American residents. Who else are you talking to? This is really good, but are you going to the east side and talking right in the community with the neighborhood groups? Are you going to the west side and talking right in the community with the neighborhood groups and connecting with the community leaders in those groups? Because we actually we love Bell Isle and we want to go and want to feel welcome. But there has to be a definite connection and a definite uh, intentional outreach to the population that lives in the city. So uh, what, as far as programming goes, 
that's how that's how else you're really going to find out what we need. Just as Paul Lee mentioned, you know, a lot of African Americans don't necessarily go use all the amenities. We just want some place to sit. We just want because I take my I take my my little fold out chair all the time, and I just I have my favorite spot. It's on the Canadian side, and I take my chair and just I just sit. And just to have places, I don't want to call it congregating, but I just want to call it gathering. So that we can just breathe and look out. A lot of people go to meditate. And so you need to connect with the, the populations in the neighborhood, because that's where we are. Yeah. We are in the neighborhoods and talk, connect with those community leaders. That's definite outreach. That's the outreach that needs to be done. This may be, is this your beginning? This is the third session of the process. And where were the other two? Uh, the, uh, the one was last night at the Coleman Young Recreation Center, and then the one prior to that was on the awesome. island at the casino. Okay. So, um, but we it, and we've also done um, community meetings with Representative Chang at Great Messiah <coughs> Church. We've um, partnered with Member Sheffield uh, and, and the like, and we plan to do much more of that. We've met with the Baptist Minister Council. Um, so, but now that, as Katie mentioned earlier, we've hired our community engagement specialist. We're going to have the capacity and the ability to get out and meet with all the neighborhood groups and the faith community and really develop there, that personal relationship. If you don't know, there are, are a plethora of block clubs, right. community organizations in Detroit. I mean, there are so many, and you can have wonderful conversations with them. That's exactly what we want to do. <laughs> yes, we need you, Andrea. <laughs> I'll be calling. Sure. I'll give you my call. That would be great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Oh, oh, wait, wait. Oh. There's another newcomer. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I think it's great to be here. I always learn something when I come to a bookstore. This gentleman mentioned the bathhouse was called Alcatraz. Yeah. I never knew that. And my brothers were lifeguards in 67 on Belle Isle. This is just a little anecdote. And I'll make my comments. And they were both called in to turn the bathhouse into a jail, oh, and they God. had no construction experience. My brother broke his back when one of the brick walls fell on him. So they're all amateurs, of course. My brother's a catch and three of the rug, big deal. But anyway, my name is Donald Green, and I thank you for the opportunity to be here this evening. I'm already on the record for my vehement opposition to the Grand Prix and the Red Bull publicity stunt. Therefore, I will move on to comments previously made here that may or may not have anything to do with the purpose of this meeting. But I, too, was stopped by the state police last year on Belle Isle because I, quote, I don't think you stopped for that stop sign. And I was also asked, what are you doing here? And I felt like saying, I'm in a park, you idiot. What do you think I'm doing? <laughs> but of course, I didn't say that. As far as lifeguards, then this is an important point. There are no lifeguards at any state park. A lot of people don't realize that, so they will not be having lifeguards on Bell Isle. But then again, there are no auto races at any other state park. Amen. <laughs> so we'll figure that out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, excuse me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Janet. I just want to build on uh, Sandra's remark um, about your associates. Uh, thoughts about how monies can be generated through private enterprise. And I'm kind of thinking about that because I wonder if the state, is anyone from the DNR here? Yeah. So, I mean, the state entered into an agreement with the city and they would lease and they would take care of and maintain and, and so forth. And so there must have been a cost for that. There must have been a cost for that. And I don't know if they figured into their budget that the Grand Prix would kick in so many million a year to help offset the cost of managing the island, or whether it was the state putting in all the money, or are they relying on the Grand Prix money? So my question is, what is the shortfall if we were not getting Grand Prix money? Not just new lights on the Carthage Bridge and, and, and casino fix-ups, but actual revenue to go into the island. You know, what's the shortfall if we didn't have the Grand Prix? you know, actual dollar shortfall. And in this day and age at, in Detroit, we've got some traction. We've got an attractive city. We might be able to generate some private revenue to make up that shortfall. I don't know what the millions are that the Grand Prix is kicking in, but who knows? I mean, I think there's some possibilities that Detroit has been down so 
down on itself for so long. These are new possibilities to generate revenue for Belle Isle that we haven't even dreamed of. I, I, I don't know what's possible, but I don't think we should have to rely on Grand Prix money. So I'd like to have some kind of an accounting or some kind of a, a breakdown of what what the Grand Prix has, and this is outside your province, I know that, I know that, George, but uh, it, it, believe me, Grand Prix would not fall into being a decaying nightmare that it was just if the Grand Prix left. We would not be left with another horrible, deteriorating island. So I want to talk about the finances, how we might be able to generate some private interest in developing ideas that would bring revenue to the island. So I'll just leave it at that. So it's it's been a, a weird transition. And I think uh, you know a lot of folks in this room here, uh, as far as the management advocates, uh, were not involved uh, three four years ago when um, our rec department ran the island. And during that period, there was a moment where we were gifted back the Grand Prix, gifted, um, and this massive music festival, this heavy metal festival, and there was a lot of uh, frustration from the users because not only did we lose the most picturesque part of the island, then we lost the Canadian side almost entirely for a week and a half for a music concert that came out in the media and said, oh, we're going to leave it better than we found it. The athletic fields will be restored and all these things. This guy here used to play soccer out there since he was five years old, practicing on Belle Isle every Tuesday and Thursday. And when that festival left, it was gravel and truck ruts and just nothingness. And that was about the time the DNR was looking to take over and the, the much talked about um, uh, struggles with that uh, agreement. And they had moved their soccer team off the island where they had played for so long. And what was, what was candy coated as something that was going to be good for us was bad. So I think, you know, the DNR and the Conservancy and everyone involved it feels a lot of that, um, like a lot of that anger from things that they had no control over. It was really wreck at that point. But it's yours now. So um, <laughs> you now have this thing you have to, uh, you know, you're charged with uh, being a caretaker of. And now when we see the Grand Prix and the much uh, publicized improvements that are happening, island, happening to the island, they're almost exclusively around the Grand Prix Yes, area. it is. So Absolutely. Just, so now people are even more frustrated. Like, boy, you know, I come out there on my bike and I'm riding and it's nice and dry here. I get to the back side of it and I understand there's topographical issues back there, but those drains don't work and it's water covered regularly. So I feel for you, but we got to fix this. We got to get, you know, kind of some equity across all user groups on the island. Um, listen to everyone talk today, I think there's a kind of thing of sanctuary. For me, it's a sanctuary on my bike out there every morning. I battle traffic from the west side and rush hour in the morning, you know, it's 7 a.m. and you know, it, there's nonsense out on the road if you haven't seen it. Um, and I get to the island, I get to that bridge, and it's like, oh, okay, I don't have to worry about that crap for you know, the next hour. But now, lately, I'm seeing these larger events being attracted to the island. I know there's another one coming up this weekend, a rowing event or a water event. Um, and you have new user groups from the suburbs who are coming down there. They don't know how to get there, so they're staring at their GPS. It's telling them to turn. They're turning the wrong way on the loop, and they're speeding over the bridge. Um, it's, it's almost gotten worse in some ways for my use. Uh, I'm not going to say it's the same for everyone, but, you know, uh, we've got to do something about the traffic. We really have to enforce at the base of the bridge. It's not good enough to paint 25 only at the guard gate. You've got to enforce at the bridge. The bridge doesn't need to be five lanes. Traffic calming on the bridge. You know, uh, the only reason that bridge needs to be five lanes is for events like the Grand Prix and these these festival atmosphere events. Um, that's all I got. I got one suggestion though. Uh, for a new use, uh, paddle in and bike in only campsites to to go along with the iron or whatever trail. Okay, okay on June 24th. Dan Biederman was at the Belle Isle Casino, and at that time I asked him about uh, the subject of restaurants. I told him my personal feeling about restaurants is that they should support people who are involved in recreational activities in the park. And I mentioned that he, uh, in Bryant Park, there's the Park Grill, which is a high-end uh, restaurant uh, meal, might cost $50 or more. 
And um, I asked him, uh, and I mentioned that restaurants create traffic problems, they use valuable space. And then I asked him, I, I, and I'm taking this uh, conversation a step further. I, I was hoping he'd be here, but anyhow, with the Rattlesnake Club a mile away, um, such a restaurant would be just creating a separate destination. And so I asked him on, on, that, on that basis, does he still think that that type of a restaurant would be suitable for Belle Isle? And he said he thought visitors to Belle Isle should have a choice. Um, a, big, a big concern that I have with the restaurant is, if any restaurant on the island <coughs> is the impact on the surroundings. For instance, if a wonderful place, or a location for a restaurant would be right on that south shoreline, looking across at Canada, you know, big sheets of glass, etc. But to me, that would be um, a catastrophic use of space. Now, um, it was said here that Mr. Biederman does not want to utilize government funding. He wants to utilize foundation funding. And, and my question is, um, are, are restaurants a part of uh, the thinking for the, um, for the redevelopment plan? Uh, I would say that there's something that we would, I, food and beverage service is something that we would think about on the island as something that could be a part of uh, what's there. But I think what Dan said, I think I was standing with you on that day on June 24th, was that mm -hmm. um, we never put in a, a place to get food um, uh, just to make money because we need it to, to keep things in. It's only if it's something that... Um, <coughs> benefit adds to the park experience mm -hmm. in some texture or another. You know, there's lots of different experiences that happen in parks and public spaces, especially in Sazabella. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, then, sure, it, it is an added bonus that it, that it mm -hmm. helps pay for operations. So I would say it's something we're considered and, and would love uh, people's opinions on. Well, that's reassuring to me. That's not what you said. Let's go to the next. Yeah. yeah. Tell me about the bikers, the walkers versus the cars. People have traditionally driven their cars around Belle Isle. That's just a tradition. I mean, some people don't want to walk. I don't think Belle Isle can be everything. I mean, I've observed the bikers right here and the cars right here is dangerous. But maybe, maybe a tremendous number of bikes can't happen on Belle Isle. I know that's not a popular idea. Maybe tremendous, tremendous amounts of walkers cannot happen on Belle Isle. To me, when Belle Isle was, I don't know, transferred or given to, to the city of Detroit, I think it was a sort of sedate kind of place. Now, are we going to change it and bring out tons of ride, bike riders, tons of I, To me, that's not appropriate. Every bell I cannot be everything. Some people talk about they want tranquility. To me, for bike riding, Detroit Riverfront Conservancy has addressed that. They've addressed the walkers. I'm not in favor of, of, of bringing up a tremendous, huge amount of bikers on our record. I mean, what about happening one day, maybe Monday, bike day? Oh, no car. Everybody can ride the bike. Tuesday, walkers, just tons of walkers. The rest of the time, to me, people who brought your, your, your blanket on the ground, brought your, your picnic basket, kickback in your easy, whatever. But to me, it cannot be everything. And I'm definitely not in favor of any, any big size restaurants. Oh, yeah. Definitely not. I mean, maybe one or two food trucks here or there. Not this big conglomerate thing. But I mean, it just can't be everything. I mean, it can't sound, to me, to me, the, I, I really struggle with your comments about you there for four hours and about and wherever you went and came. But, but I mean, you just can't do it. I mean, I'm not in favor of it. I like the, the tranquil, peaceful. It's not a place you can go. And I think this man said earlier, when you come over that bridge, you just kind of let it all out. Yeah. You know, I don't want to see a circus atmosphere. I don't want to see Detroit Riverfront. I mean, they do a beautiful job of what they do. But let them do that there. Campus marshes do Wi-Fi. Well, I was like a little oasis. I don't want to see that change. Yes. Um, one thing uh, I want to say, because I heard people saying it, is I'm not looking, this is not his vision, this is our vision. That's why we're here. And he's not the caretaker, Michelle, the conservancy, and we're the caretakers with her to support her. Three is, I don't know uh, how many of you know, but the Bell Isle's closed at night. And so you talked yes. about 
it was a place people who didn't have air conditioning, and a lot of us still don't, we would go to the island and hang out at night and cool off besides going to the beach. And my son and I just happened to like, we're waiting for a pizza, and like, let's ride around Belle Isle. And we're driving around like, the lights are not. There's no working lights. So I didn't know if they were uh, not functioning or if they were purposely turned off. And then we realized as we left, I think a state officer said something to us, well, you know, it's closing, you're leaving now. And you're like, I had no idea. So I mean, you know, that again takes away from what the community had always, is the place to hang out at night, let off steam, hot summer days. It's a, it's a place to catch a cool breeze and hang out with your friends. And yes, even us white people used to hang out at Belle Isle. <laughs> and, Ham and all the high schools in Hamtramck had a place on the island that was their spot, and we'd go all visit each other. But it, it's always been that kind of hangout place. I just have real quick comments. Um, I think Belle Isle is special because of the nature. I also think it's special because of the history. And building on your comments and other comments in the room, I would love if the plan included either, you know, markers or in the welcome center, some sort of info and photos yeah. and stories and oral histories and maybe as part of the sculpture garden just to kind of retain and, and celebrate kind of that, that history as well. And lastly, I think that, you know, the buildings there are stunning and I think that whatever plans, they should stay open to the public and kind of keep that uh, preservation both with you know, the, the, the nature and the, the history of the island. So that's good. That's, that's A voice we have not heard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for great comments and an, an amazing discussion um, and passion. This is what keeps us excited and, and interested and, and we're really excited to have a few more Well, the last word. the teacher point at me and tell me Well, I think we made great progress tonight. So thank you so much. We'll be sure, hopefully you all signed in. We'll be sure to keep you all apprised and in touch of next steps. And then that will also help us um, be able to keep in touch with you on an ongoing basis. So, Thank you again to being our muscle tonight, Janet and Sandra, for making it happen, and to our DNR teammates for being here as well, and uh, to George, too, for all of your efforts. So, um, and if I can give my contact information to anybody who would like it, just send me an email, or give me a call, I'm happy to. I think we did. I'll give one last thing. Uh, we have a bookmark on everybody's chair. Everybody, please, 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 Know what's going on here at the store. Also, our information about the store is on the back of the book. So if you want to meet us or read anybody else, uh, you can certainly do it to us here. Uh, just love yours. You are our, our, our people today. Thank you. You have to have a tough skin to be in the store.